I'm going to press record. And thank you, all of us, for joining us for um, the Virtual Water Ambassador Program. Water Ambassador Program is an educational program um, funded by Martin County and delivered by the University of Florida IPITS Extension and Florida Sea Grant Program. It's an educational program designed to address uh, stormwater impacts on water quality, specifically in Martin County. Um, let's see here. Okay, so just again, as a quick overview of the Zoom platform, we ask that you all mute yourselves uh, during the duration of the presentation. And if you aren't hearing me for some reason at this point, just click that carrot button, the up arrow, and then you can adjust your audio settings there. Um, we ask that you don't use your video just for bandwidth purposes. At the end, when we do question and answers, you can certainly put it back on. Um, you can see who is participating today, who's joined us in the participant chat box. And we ask that you utilize the chat box for all questions. We're going to hold questions until the end and then come back and refer to them there. So you can type questions into the chat box throughout the duration of the presentation. Um, we are recording this presentation. And if by any reason you need to leave, just click that red leave meeting button. And lastly, if you, um, want to adjust your visual settings just click we suggest the side by side mode we are recording this as we have all of the other presentations um for whatever reason the url to the web page has changed and we apologize for that we are going to try and revert it back to the original url this is the modified one with the inclusion of water ambassadors in the web link um, that being said, the easiest way to access all of the recordings is just to Google Martin County um, Water Ambassador Program or Martin County Sea Grant, and it'll bring you to the page regardless of what the URL is. Lisa, just as an update to that, um, I just heard from the web team, they're going to try to make both links active, so either one will work. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. And again, just a reminder to please use the chat feature to ask questions. And um, we apologize for the change in the schedule. Unfortunately, Zach had some unexpected um, situation arise, so he was unable to participate today. So we are um, rescheduling him for August 24th, talking about the Jensen Beach Impoundment Mangrove Restoration Project. And in two weeks on August 10th, we have Dr. Todd Osborne with the University of Florida talking about clam restoration in the IRL. I think I inadvertently said oyster restoration in the emails, but is in fact clam restoration in the IRL. So look forward to those two um, upcoming webinars and those will be the last webinars for this season's Water Ambassador Program, but um, we will be back for 2022. Um, we also are going to try and put together a graduate's field trip sometime at the end of August. So be on the lookout for those of you who are local to the area, be on the lookout for an email about that and visit maybe one of the sites that we talked about during our webinar series. And today for the presentation, um, you have your moderator speaking to you today. So it's gonna be a joint presentation by myself, Lisa Krimsky. I am the Regional Water Resource Extension Agent with the University of Florida IPIS Extension and Sea Grant. And my partner in crime, Vincent Incomio, who is the Sea Grant Agent in Martin and St. Lucie counties with IPIS Extension. And we are gonna be um, talking together about sargassum. I'm gonna start off talking about the global sargassum um, harmful algal blooms, and then Vincent is going to end uh, bringing it closer to home, talking about some local mitigation efforts. So with that, I am going to switch over my screen. Give me a second to change over presentations, and thanks for joining us. Let's see. Okay, are you seeing? Looks looks perfect, um, uh, Lisa. Okay, 
Excellent. So, um, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be talking about sargassum, a global harmful algal bloom. Okay. And um, when you're talking about sargassum, this is an algae species. It's a type of brown algae, and it's in fact a macro algae, which means that you can see it with the naked eye. You don't need a microscope to see it. There are more than 60 species of benthic sargassum globally. And by benthic, what I mean is that they are attached to the bottom by these root-like structures. They don't have actual roots because they are algae, but they have root-like structures called holdfasts. However, in the Caribbean region, including Florida, there are two pelagic spe species. This means that they are free-floating. Um, and they are sargassum natans and sargassum flutons, which you can see in the top corners of those images there. These are holopelagic, which means that they spend the entire life cycle free floating. And um, in case any of you are into trivia, this is actually the world's only holopelagic seaweeds. Um, and they float at or near the surface where they accumulate into these large mats or windrows, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner in that image there. And um, they accumulate by winds and then are further dispersed by currents. They repro reproduce vegetatively by fragmentation. Um, and that's sort of how they, um, you get to see these large mats. So sargassum is the namesake for the Sargasso Sea. This is an ecosystem that's based entirely upon the floating sargassum seaweed algae. And the Sargasso Sea is actually the only sea without land boundaries. And its boundaries are entirely defined by currents. So, and then within those currents, the sargassum is sort of entrained within it. And for this reason, sargassum within the Sargasso Sea becomes a mid-ocean refuge for migratory species. And it's sort of this crossroad in the Atlantic for these species which come to the Sargasso Sea in order to feed, spawn, and find protection amongst, amidst the seagrass masts before they move throughout the ocean. Um, because of this large biodiversity available um, associated with the sargassum mats, these have been called golden floating rainforests. And in fact, um, there's more than 100 species of fish that have been estimated to reside within the um, sargassum mats and approximately 145 invertebrate species. And there are 10 species that are endemic to the floating sargassum, which means that they're not found anywhere else in the world. They are explicitly associated with the sargassum as a habitat. In addition to being beneficial for biodiversity, um, again, associated with that breeding, nursery, and feeding habitats, sargassum mats are extraordinarily important for carbon sequestration. They are plants, and so they utilize um, carbon during photosynthesis, and they become a major sink for carbon in the ocean environment. Lastly, once they um, come onshore due to um, the currents in the ocean and the winds and they're beached, sargassum becomes a food source for a variety of intertidal organisms. So not just the sargassum itself is an algae, but also the little um, associated organisms which are sort of trapped within the leaves. And so this is, becomes an important food source for crustaceans and various shorebirds. Sargassum also helps to stabilize the shorelines. It adds vegetative biomass to the beach structure and it's an important nutrient source. So there's a lot of nutrients that are trapped within the tissue of the algae itself. And then upon um, uh, decay and breakdown, the nutrients within the beach sargassum actually become an essential fertilizer for dune plants. So in recognition of the importance of this sargassum explicitly in the open ocean in the Sargasso Sea, um, it has been, designated as an essential fish habitat by the United States. It's been recognized by the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. And in 2010, under um, sort of the leadership of the Bermuda government, the Sargasso Sea Alliance was created entirely for the protection and management of sargassum in the Sargasso Sea. So when we talk about um, management and protection of natural resources. 
a lot of times scientists and natural resource or resource managers have to translate those benefits into a monetary value. Um, and this is a way for us to really communicate the value of those services that these um, natural resources and habitats provide to humans. And so these services or benefits are termed ecosystem services. And in 2010, WWF produced this fantastic infographic sort of um, quantifying the economic ecosystem service valuation of the Sargasso Sea. Um, and so what you can see is that not only are there fishery benefits and tourism benefits, as well as benefits associated with these migratory species, explicitly whales and um, tunas and sea turtles, but there's also some really significant ecosystem um, services that are provided. So climate regulation, again, from that carbon sequestration, um, conservation of genetic diversity, moderation of extreme events, and then what I really want you to focus on again is that nutrient cycling and water purification and waste management. So within the cells of the sargassum itself, they have alginates, which is a type of polysaccharide, which is actually allows it to sort of entrain a lot of these nutrients as well as metals and other contaminants within the tissues of the cells themselves. Um, and so you can see when you add it up all together, the ecosystem services associated with Sargassum in the Sargasso Sea is valued at nearly $2.8 billion. So extraordinarily important. Um, when we talk about Sargassum in the ocean, open ocean, the Sargassum blooms, and a bloom just refers to the accumulation of algal biomass. So these are often referred to as golden tides because of the golden color of the seaweed. And golden tides are not a new phenomenon. In fact, Christopher Columbus is credited with the first written account of sarcasm during his epic voyage in 1492 when he sailed to the ocean blue. Um, there's also verified records of golden tides and beach sargassum along the coast in Galveston, Texas, dating back to the 1800s. So again, they're not new. They predate um, human settlement in the region and sort of have always been part of this open ocean uh, ecosystem. However, what is new is sort of this massive influx of sargassum that we've witnessed since 2011. And once the sargassum gets pushed onshore due to the prevailing winds, the decomposition of the beach sargassum changes from this golden color where it exists in the open ocean to this brown color associated with the decaying of nature of the algae. Um, and this is when they be can become either a nuisance or harmful. And they're um, the name of these algae blooms actually changes and they're referred to as brown tides. And so this is to distinguish them from the beneficial golden tides that are seen in the open ocean. So what I'm showing here is sort of how these brown tides came about and the um, hypothesized initiation of these uh, brown tides. The image that you can see in the top left, what that shows is the mean coverage of sargassum in the Caribbean Sea and Central Atlantic Ocean. So the higher the peak, the more coverage of sargassum over that region. And what you can see that arrow is pointing to 2011. So that's sort of that peak year where we first saw this massive influx of sargassum. Um, it is now the largest macroalgae bloom in the world. And as you can see in the bottom image, that map, it stretches more than 5,500 miles from the Gulf of Mexico on the west to Western Africa. And the biomass of sargassum um, reaches more than 20 million tons. And because of this and this massive extent across the Atlantic, it's now called the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. Um, it is near annual occurrence since 2011, and in fact, 2011 was the first time in recorded history that sargassum was ever seen um, along the coast of Africa. So 
The growth of this sargassum is triggered by a number of things. A new seed population, which I'll talk about a little bit more in future slides, um, an increase in nutrients in the open ocean. So this is an area that's historically low in nutrients, but um, nutrients sort of are brought up both from upwelling events, as well as it's been hypothesized that it's nutrients associated with land-based sources of nutrients um, with, uh, due to the Amazon runoff. Um, it's also associated with normal or cooler temperatures and normal salinity. And I'm making note of that because the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt and these brown tides have been attributed to climate change, um, but not the change in sea surface temperature or the increase in sea surface temperature, which is what we normally think of when we think of climate change, but in fact, the changing of ocean currents. So this is um, a map showing the sargassum transport historically, and this is an overly simplified map, so I apologize if we have any oceanographers in the audience here, but it's um, just sort of an easy framework to see how sargassum historically got transported in the region. So what you can see is that um, it starts within the sargassum sea near Bermuda where sargassum tends to be retrained. And then it's transported southward through the passes of the North Caribbean. The currents within the Caribbean Sea can then sweep sargassum towards the Gulf of Mexico where it enters the Gulf of Mexico through the Yucatan Strait. And then occasionally a periodic, a periodic gyre within the Gulf of Mexico um, will break off from the Gulf Stream. And this has the potential to take sargassum with it. And this is when we see sargassum beached along the shores of Texas, such as in, in Galveston um, or in North Mexico. The remainder of the sargassum gets entrained within the Gulf Stream. Some of it will come ashore along um, the east coast of Florida, which we're fairly familiar with here um, in South Florida, seeing sargassum beached on shore. And the rest of it um, will return via the Gulf Stream into the Sargasso Sea, thereby terminating its voyage and sort of restarting that cycle all over again. However, since 2011, um, what we've seen is um, an anomalous shift in what is being termed the North Atlantic Oscillation. And this is um, described in a publication from 2020 in Johns et al. And what you can see is the North Atlantic Oscillation is a periodic change in sea level pressure. And the variation in this oscillation um, will shift the location of the jet stream, which then in turn sort of drives wind and ocean current um, location in the North Atlantic Ocean. So in this inset image, the um, red and blue peaks, what you're seeing here is that North Atlantic oscillation with a positive shift being in red. And when we have positive shifts, the jet stream um, will move currents northwards whereas a negative shift seen in blue will move the currents southwards. And highlighted in yellow in 2010 was this anomalous negative southward event that occurred and persisted over several months. And as a result of this really strong negative event, what they propose happens is that winds, um, and surface currents from the Sargasso Sea was able to evict some of that sargassum eastwards. Um, and that's where it, how it impacted and ended up along Gibraltar and the coast of Africa. Um, this sort of anomalous eastward winds and the currents that defined a new temporary pathway for sargassum to move eastward and eventually join the Canary Current. Once in the Canary Current and advected to the North Equatorial Current, the sargassum is advected southward um, and southwest where it enters this large region of the Caribbean and tropical Atlantic. It, because of where it is located um, along the equatorial line, there's a lot of favorable light, a lot of nutrients available due to upwelling. And so sargassum now flourishes in that region. 
And what we now have is a resident population of sargassum in the central tropical Atlantic that aggregates due to wind convergence along that intertropical convergence zone. And what you see is that red oval is this new population of sustained sargassum in a region where we historically didn't see it. Um, sargassum is then advected into the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, um, and a new regime is established. And then we have these remnant dispersed patches, which provide a seed population for um, accumulation in the intertropical convergence zone the following year. So again, we've created this new cycle of transport and a new population of sargassum that flourishes due to light and nutrient availabilities in the region. So what does this mean? Um, officially, we have a new global harmful algal bloom. And the definition of a harmful algal bloom is an algal bloom that produces toxic or harmful effects on human health or aquatic ecosystems. As I mentioned before, this is a non-toxic algae, but due to the sheer volumes and biomass, we are seeing harmful effects on human health and aquatic ecosystems. So it does indeed meet the definition of harmful algal bloom, where previously sargassum blooms were sort of defined or classified as just being nuisance blooms. So what are those impacts? Um, we're gonna focus on some of them. I want to um, make sure you notice that these, the degree of impacts do vary by year and location. So this is um, sort of a summary of the potential impacts and doesn't mean that this is happening everywhere that we see these brown tide sargassum blooms. But the first one, the first impact that we have is that just the cost and the um, logistics associated with cleanup. So it's been estimated that it would take about $120 million to clean up Caribbean sargassum inundations annually. And then once you do clean it up, you have to have a place where you can actually put it. You need a safe space for disposal. And this becomes a major challenge for those island nations that really where space is limited. Um, disposal needs to occur in, in an area where infiltration and contamination of groundwater and drinking water supplies can't occur. Um, when left to decay on its own, the natural bacterial breakdown produces hydrogen sulfide. And so this produces an unpleasant odor, which again detracts from tourism, um, but it also becomes a human health hazard for those residing or working near the decaying masses. In addition to those logistics and the human health impacts, removing beach sea sargassum is also a way um, is also causing beach erosion due to the removal of sand whenever you're having sort of this large scale raking or trucking away of the algae. The next impact are the ecosystem health impacts. And so there was a study that was done in Mexico that examined the impacts of sargassum beaching on the near shore waters and the environments. And I want to focus your attention to the bottom left hand image there. And what you can see pretty obviously is that the decay of those massive quantities of beach sargassum changes the color of the water. So you have those leachates um, coming out of the tissues, this organic particles, it turns the water this brown murky color, you have increased turbidity, um, obvious reductions in light, changes in pH and oxygen and increases in temperature associated with just the decay within the near shore environment. Um, as previously mentioned, the tissues of the sargassum also retain a lot of nutrients in it. And so when you have this decay in the near shore environment, you're also having this massive release of nutrients. And it's been estimated that um, the monthly influx of nitrogen released was about 13,600 pounds and 135 pounds of phosphorus, uh, which results in local eutrophication of the waters. And I know that those numbers maybe don't mean a whole lot in context. So if you can imagine the monthly influx of nitrogen was more than the land-based sources of nitrogen over an entire year. And one of the themes that we've been talking about um, over the course of the Water Ambassador Program is the impacts of land-based sources of nutrients on coastal waters. And so you can imagine really what this, you know, one month eutrophication means for 
um, the health of the local near shore aquatic ecosystem. Um, focusing back to the top right images there, that's a seagrass meadow. And what that same study evaluated the impacts of seagrasses and on coral species. And what they found was that due to the losses of light and the increased temperature, as well as the sulfides, which has a major impact on seagrass health, um, the below ground biomass of seagrass was reduced from about 60 to 99.5%. And then because of that below ground death and mortality, you then had the opportunity for these non-beneficial um, calcareous algae and drift algae to sort of take over and replace the healthy seagrass meadows. And then as for um, corals, near shore corals suffered total or partial mortality. Moving on to fisheries and aquaculture. So um, you again experience because of the sulfide um, release, the low oxygen, the, um, the high nutrients. You saw faunal death associated with those high epoxia, hydrogen sulfide, high ammonia concentrations. Um, you also see death associated with entanglements or just sort of being trapped in that biomass. And this is a huge thing for sea, uh, sea turtles. You also have entanglements of the fishing gear itself. So you have both engines being clogged, bilge pumps being clogged, and then imagine trying to pull sort of fishing seines or um, traps or other gear through these, you know, massive quantities of sargassum. It becomes a major impediment to a successful fishery. And in many of these Caribbean nations, um, subsistence fishery is a major source of um, dollars and protein for the community. So it's um, a huge impact. Lastly, focusing on tourism. Um, tourism in the Caribbean region contributes more than 80% of the region's gross domestic product and is worth approximately $29 billion. And just to show that it's not just the Caribbean region that's being impacted, again, South Florida is in an area that um, receives sargassum associated with the currents. And this is a picture from the Palm Beach Post in Palm Beach County in 2018. So whenever um, you have these large events, it's going to have a major impact on the local tourism. So what can we do about it? Um, so we already discussed that there are many benefits associated with sargassum um, when it's in sort of the open ocean and you don't have these large accumulations of biomass. And sargassum has been recognized for these numerous potential benefits above and beyond just the ecosystem services that we've talked about. Um, so <laughs> in doing my research for this, I actually came across um, a 1960s issue of Donald Duck um, produced by Walt Disney. And the theme of this issue is it's called Secrets of the Sargasso Sea. And the description of this issue is, Donald, Scrooge, and the nephews face adventure and danger when Scrooge tries to start a seaweed farm at the Sargasso Sea. So even back in the 1960s, the value of sargassum and the opportunities for um, market <laughs> um, were, were recognized so much so that it became a cartoon. But you know, the realized benefits um, and current uses of sargassum include fertilizer and animal feed, um, it's being investigated for pharmaceuticals and as possible biofuels. And so um, in terms of management of these blooms, the exploitation of this sargassum biomass and the valorization or um, bringing to market this sargassum is considered one of the best options um, and could potentially be a source for increasing renewable energy. That being said, um, there are a lot of obstacles associated with it. One of the biggest obstacles, again, is due to the major efficiency that sargassum has in terms of being able to absorb nutrients and heavy metals. What that means is that it, um, whenever you're using it for certain uses, it has to go through chemical analysis and compliance with international guidelines to be met. So for example, total arsenic is a major concern um, in sargassum um, and that in many samples, sarga, um, 
arsenic can exceed the limits for animal feed or in agricultural soils. And then, you know, these toxic metals and the concentration of those metals are going to vary in place and time. So if you're going to be able to bringing them to market, you need to, it becomes an added expense um, and a monetary burden associated with it. But there's a suite of potential uses um, in some of the obstacles. Again, it's not a reliable supply, so we're not always going to be able to rely on having sargassum handy at any point in time. The transportation costs, um, like those pollutants, and removing salts. For many of the um, potential uses, you just have to remove the salts as well as any of um, the other organisms that are associated with it. But there has been a huge effort in developing removal technologies um, to prevent sargassum from reaching the shorelines, especially in those tourism based areas, and you can see some of those removal technologies listed at the bottom. So what does this mean. Um, well, we hope that um, we're going to be able to come up with a legitimate sort of market value use for sargassum, but the reality is, is it's probably years away from having any concrete alternative use. Um, and we don't really know whether the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt is here to stay or if it's just a long term anomaly associated with that shift in the NOA. So right now, one of the best tools that we have in our tool belt is forecasting tools. Um, University of South Florida has the Sargassum Watch system and they produce monthly bulletins for the entire Caribbean region. And this forecast bloom locations and intensities and can help local governments prepare, um, identify where they should be using some of these removal technologies, if they should be employing booms or other um, exclusion devices and where they really should be prioritizing their disposal efforts. So this is the most recent map I was able to find the bulletin from May 2021. Um, they should be putting another one out shortly. And with that, I am going to um, turn it over to Vincent, who's going to talk about a project that he's participated in at the local level. All right, thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, let's see, I think this should be the right one. Is that showing up? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. Thanks, Lisa. And that was a great introduction to this global problem. And uh, as, as Lisa mentioned, I'm working on a local project along with other uh, Sea Grant um, colleagues. Uh, some of, of them are on this call right now, and we're actually uh, doing this project looking at the potential for sargassum as a compost material in on the west coast. Uh, you, well, it's a different species on the west coast of Florida, but down in the Keys and then over right here, uh, right here in Martin County. And as Lisa had mentioned, the increase that started around 2011 has had some, uh, it's been a recurring problem with the most notable peak was back in 2018. And that's when I noticed personally that it was in the local news quite a lot. And aside from that, there's also been some economic analysis of if particularly for the keys and, and the impact on, on that, that may have on the tourism industry uh, down there. And to show some comparisons of some of the costs associated with sargassum removal or mitigation, um, they're comparing uh, about three three different places in Mexico, in the and in the Caribbean, Martinique and Guadeloupe, and you can see the the, the costs of removal mitigation in 2018, and this group estimated what what could that annual cost be for the Keys, as, uh, given their coastline, the, the miles of coastline, and the cost it might take per mile of that coastline. And so you're looking at a pretty significant cost, projected cost, at, at, you know, in the worst case scenario of over, over $10 million. So, so it's definitely the, everything that Lisa has covered up to this point definitely points to um, uh, 
significant, a potentially significant problem. And our area on the Treasure Coast is is not immune to to these beachings as well. Probably not as uh, frequent as these areas in Mexico and the Caribbean. But this is a this is a photo, uh, I believe from. The, the photo is dated 2019, but I believe this is from 2018, and this is right in Fort Pierce. And I'll show you some recent photos of that area uh, just to demonstrate that this is a recurring problem at, at some of our local beaches. But this idea of composting has already sort of been uh, in play or, or utilized by local municipalities down in Broward, such as the city of Fort Lauderdale. And they already have a sargassum composting program. And the photos that you see there, um, let me put my pointer over here. You can see that they, they, they rake the beach when it builds up. They've got an area where they can uh, dump that, that excess sargassum. And then that, that gets mixed in with other materials for composting. So this is on a municipal scale. And the, but the one question that we had, uh, th so that this, City of Fort Lauderdale uses this sargassum compost for a lot of their, their municipal landscaping. But one of the questions we had is, as Lisa had mentioned earlier, sargassum and, and a lot of other uh, algae, particularly brown algae, can accumulate heavy metals. In the case of sargassum, the, the one of concern is arsenic. And she mentioned that the structures or chemicals within that uh, macroalgae that, that actually make up their biomass, alginates, have a strong affinity for accumulating heavy metals. And so if we're using this for municipal landscaping, it's probably not, uh, may not be as big of a concern, but the question is, is this something that can be used in the home for uh, say your, your vegetable gardens or, or basically growing your food? So along, uh, along with our uh, other Sea Grant colleagues, uh, we, we got a, a small grant to look at this uh, issue. And with the basic questions, uh, I won't read all this off, but the basic questions is, you know, that we have are, you know, what are the amounts of sargassum that we, that we pick up or, or use in uh, compost from, from these uh, beach events? Um, how, much, how much should we, sargassum should we use as an amendment to to existing compost to maybe minimize those ar arsenic levels. And, and how does that, sar ultimately, how does that sargassum compost perform? It, it's probably working fairly well, it seems like for the city of Fort Lauderdale, and it, it does give them an opportunity to uh, beneficially use uh, a material that has become problematic at, at uh, um, several of their beaches, as well as down in, in Dade and Monroe counties. So, I kind of jumped onto this program, this project late, uh, and but I sort of had to scramble and and try to look for areas at the. I think this was back in the fall of 2020, and so I put out this notice to the public, trying to find areas where sargassum was accumulating in our, on our local beaches, and I and I found that that photo that I showed earlier uh, in Fort Pierce. But uh, what, what's come out of that, it, it was, uh, I was able to visit a few beaches and it was pretty variable. Our, our coastline's fairly straight. So there aren't a lot of places where it, it may accumulate, but it doesn't persist uh, and, and, and get stuck on that beach for a long period of time. But I was able through that process, kind of hook up with some, some other potential future partners, well, current, but now uh, you know, future partners, this is at the FPL nuclear power plant on Hutchinson Island. And if any of you know about that locally, they have an intake canal that, that cools their uh, system. So they're taking ocean from uh, water from the ocean on a continual basis. And they have these big nets that trap, that basically prevent large animals. And they're particularly interested in, in protecting sea turtles and, and other listed species, but sea turtles are probably their main charge. Uh, those nets kind of keep those animals from getting too far into that intake canal. But also with that, those nets can clog. Uh, and when we have these big sargassum bloom events, those nets get clogged and it creates problems for, for that utility. 
So I've worked with uh, In Water uh, Research, which is the consulting firm that's tasked with removing turtles and other animals from that intake canal and FPNL to kind of to be able to collect sargassum when it accumulates. And so I was able to do this actually for the first time uh, last week. Um, and uh, so they, they dump it all, they suction it out from the net, they get divers that get down in there, they suction the net off and it gets all dumped into this, this dumpster here. So I was able to get in there, um, not, not very glamorous work for a marine biologist, if you, if you ask me, but uh, it was a great way to collect um, a fair amount of sargassum in, in, in one location. The other location I was eyeing is this particular beach here. This is this is that beach that was shown. Well, the the beach or the picture that I showed earlier uh, from TC Palm that was about way probably about way down here. And if you noticed off in the distance, you might have seen this jetty. This is a photo right uh, off of that jetty right right here, and this is Jetty Beach in in Fort Pierce, and I. They've been the city cleans this beach on a somewhat regular basis when it gets too bad. So I had missed an event back in May, but I came back uh, in June and visited it toward uh, the June 30th and saw that it was starting to reaccumulate. And about three weeks later, this is what it looks like. So even though we didn't have any, um, what's unique about this beach is it's facing southeast, so it's um. And, and it's got that jetty to sort of block flow. So it really kind of acts like a, a catcher's mitt for a lot of these, a lot of the sargassum that's floating out in the sea. And preceding this period of time, which is the day I actually collected some from the beach, we had periods of low easterly to southeasterly winds. Nothing major from what I can recall. There might have been some, maybe a couple 10 to 15 knot days. But because that, that, seaweed can't go anywhere, it just accumulates here. And they, the city has gotten complaints um, about this situation. So, so they're probably in the future looking to figure out some way to consistently deal uh, with these beachings. So I went out there and with my, my little cart and, and, and some tubs and collected a little bit extra that I, that I needed uh, for the composting system that we have uh, and I'll show you another picture of the ne next slide will show that all the bins but uh, I'm also working with Martin County as a partner and they regularly produce tree tree mulch uh, removing trees that they they have to for whatever reasons and the, this is a sea grape that they chipped for me and with, and this is what it looks like in the compost bins so I along with my other partners in Monroe and, and Sarasota County, have set up uh, these these um, compost bins. These are geo bins. They're they're available uh, from the company, and they're 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 actually really nice to work with. They're very easy to set up, and so we've got different proportions of traditional mulch, uh, tree mulch, or or whatever we have for compost mixed in at different proportions with the sargassums, sargassum seaweed, and I'm actually right probably after this talk is gonna, gonna finish off filling these bins with sargassum. And as Lisa had mentioned, there are multiple uh, potential beneficial uses of sargassum seaweed, uh, composting being just one of them. And the, the, but, but of course that, that issue of heavy metals is really important um, it, because it, if it can't be used in food, then it, it does. Then we do have a, a severe limitation on what can be bene used beneficially, uh, and and the food, especially the cattle feed, is is really uh, an intriguing one because, uh, at least with other species of seaweed that have been used as supplements for for cattle feed, that has been shown to reduce methane production in those cattle. And that's a, and you know, we talked about removing that from, from the ocean because it, when it's harmful, but that could also be another potential solution for, for a climate mitigation solution. Um, if we can add that to, uh, in, in it, to feeds in a, in, for 
for that particular benefit. So we have compost here over here that I kind of covered there, what we're doing right here locally. Another uh, use that Lisa mentioned, uh, or here, I'll go through a few other uses here that are shown in that, in that previous image. Uh, in, in Mexico, there's a company that's actually using some of this excess uh, sargassum to create shoes. Uh, and other companies using this in, in bath bars and another person in Mexico is actually incorporating sargassum into adobe bricks and, and using that uh, for building. So there's, there's the multiple beneficial uses that could potentially be gained. Um, and, and with that, potentially economic opportunities as, as well, um, as well as reducing the, the impacts or mitigating those impacts from, from, from these events. So um, let me go back through here. Another benefit, and, and Lisa mentioned it, is this production of, uh, potential production of biochar. And this is, again, sort of bringing it back locally. Hopefully this is something that we can do in the future. What biochar is, is a charcoal produced from pyrolysis, which is basically extreme heat uh, combustive, combustion, heat combustion in the absence of oxygen. And what that char, what that biochar or charcoal uh, that's produced from that process can be used, you can use it for soil amendment. So composting sar sargassum, we can create biochar and actually add that to the additional sargassum uh, and, and traditional compost mix. And, and biochar has been used, shown to uh, help sequester carbon and, and retain nutrients. So, so there's some uh, good uses there. Also, it's been used to, it has a very high uh, chemical absorption uh, capacity. And that's sort of intriguing to me locally because um, recently partnered with a faculty uh, person from uh, Flor the FIT, the Florida Institute of Technology, and he's really interested in using biochar to treat or mitigate harmful algal bloom toxins say like the blue-green algae that we're all worried about in, in our area. So can this biochar material, uh, can it absorb a lot of the microcystin toxin uh, and, and basically remove it from local water bodies? And the idea uh, that's intriguing to me is if you can, if sargassum can be used as that biochar substrate, it's kind of using a have to remove a have, which I, I love that that concept. And incidentally enough, at, you know, going through, so I've partnered with uh, Dr. Riza on a grant recent grant proposal that we just submitted. And during that process, what I've also learned is that there is actually a biochar company right here in Martin County, and they're in Indian Town. So they probably work uh, very closely with agricultural industry to produce biochar, uh, and, and and my guess is it's used as a, a mainly used as a soil amendment. So we have the capacity to not only um, the, you have an example of, of large scale removal of sargassum when, it is, when it's a problem, but also potential down the line, we'll see large scale production of things like biochar that might be not, might have multiple beneficial, beneficial uses for soil amendment, nutrient, re, nutrient retention, and possibly even treating the harmful algal blooms that we have in our area that we're so concerned about. And um, I'm gonna end that right here. And, and if, you, if anybody has any questions about what I've just covered and also what, what Lisa has covered, you can either uh, please type those into the chat. Lisa's just throwing up uh, our evaluation. And so please, uh, uh, fill that out for us as well. And I also want to make a plug for volunteers. So um, I'm not expecting anybody to jump in a dumpster with me to do this, to, to collect sargassum, but I've collected pretty much everything I need. But I can use some help with turning the compost uh, right here in the, in our Mar at the Martin County Extension Office. So uh, so if anybody's interested in that and you're here locally, uh, yeah, reach out to me and, and I'd love to, 
love to have you uh, help me uh, work on this project and perhaps we can utilize the the final compost product and, and see how well it it works in your landscapes and once we get data i'll be sending i'll be sending samples to uh, Dr. Ashley, Ashley Smith in, in the, at our Fort Lauderdale Research Center um, and, and analyzing that for arsenic levels so that we can see how, how arsenic is behaving in this composting process. And that's it. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, everyone. I think we stunned them all into uh... <laughs> no questions yet in the chat box. I will stop. It's a first. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see there is some. Oh. Uh, Carrie asked if I could post my phone number again. Let me go back to that. There it is.